Okay. Yeah, so today I'll, I'll cover the material we are supposed to have covered yesterday and and also cover the stuff today. Because I'm just going to give a brief, you know, um, still going with the breath. So thank you for the feedback. I, I got three feedback about the, the course and one of them said we should probably go into a depth in some, some topic and I'll, I'll, I'll see, you know, what, what topic we can get into in, in more depth. Uh, hmm? I sent an email, right? That you can do a survey monkey. <laughs> I get it. So did you. But apparently three people got it. Did you get it? Okay, I'm not the only one, right? I didn't get it. I didn't get an email. It was a while ago, guys. Yeah, it was, it was a while. I think like two weeks ago. Yeah, you guys got it. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent it to the class made English. So from there, if you didn't get, it, it apparently went to three people, right? So anyway, I can resend it, right? <laughs> So essentially, you know, the survey monkey uh, um, feedback on what the course is going and stuff like that, right? And, and I think one of the comment was, we should have, you know, it'll be nice to have survey papers rather than the textbook, right? And I wish it was the case, but um, there are very few survey papers that I'm aware of which covers anything in 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 detail, right? I think the field is changing fast enough that survey paper right now. Um, I mean, so four year old survey paper would, would look hopelessly out, out of out of date. And there's no glory in writing survey papers, right? So who wants to write survey paper, right? So, um, so anyway, Clara will be here on Thursday. We will have the class in a regular slot. Uh, I meant to say that you should also all go to the uh, her presentation. Um, we'll still have a class. We will not discuss her research explicitly because she's going to be discussing it anyway. So I'm trying to set it up so that you can kind of see, you know, what context her work fits in, right? And we'll probably hopefully have a de demo of her, of some of her stuff and more interesting stuff will be there. Um, she's, she's extremely good. I mean, she's a nice person to talk to and all those things. So if you get a chance to talk to her, you, you, you should try to meet with her. Um, so. Uh, the the two papers from from you know one from last Thursday one today and the one uh, the following Thursday all follow into this broad notion of tele immersion you know trying to um, before we proceed how are the projects coming along for folks hopefully people are working on projects and um, what are the projects doing they know the semester I don't know what what date I gave. Um, You'll end up with the project presentation, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing like a month yeah. from now. Do, do we have a paper or only a presentation? Presentation and a paper afterwards. Um, yeah. Oh, should we, we worked on a rough schedule. Should we forward that to you? Like things we're working on? Yeah, okay. that'd be good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm leaving it kind of lazy there because I'm assuming that you guys are keeping up with some schedule. Um, so. If your group is not doing one of those, then I'm treating most of you like a grad student. You know, I'm, I'm hoping, hoping that you'll come up with something, right? Um, something good. Right? Sorry. Yeah, I hope you get done. It'll get done eventually. Because you're going to present to the whole class, and, and, and hopefully these, these are fun topics, right? So there's the, the work with um, Raja Zimmerman and, and, and his group at USC. Um, the paper talks about a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to give a brief like overview of like what, what they're hoping to achieve, right? And there's the work from UNC, and don't forget her talk. So I asked Roger to see if they have a video of, of the, 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 the symphony in action. Apparently it's a huge video, but he promised to send it over later today. Um, so if, if I get it, I can probably post it somewhere, right? So the idea was, I don't know if you can see the stuff, right? These are supposed to be for this place and this one person standing here and you're trying to have a symphony with different players from different parts of the country um, and actually have a symphony, right? So you, you would want to have a bunch of people listening to these things and then these players are all in different locations and they want to coordinate to create a symphony. And in symphony, it's important for you to synchronize with your next player, you don't want to start your piece till the previous person stops. So you, you want to have fairly good synchronization between those. So they were talking about multiple 
high definition video cameras and I think 24 channel audio going across these different ones because you know uh, you, you want your symphony to sound good, right? But before, so they, they did. That's part of the demo that they did in 2004. The other, the the, the paper was was written more on. Um, doing it within USC, basically doing it within two rooms within the same campus and having a high definition collaborative kind of uh, meeting, right? And the key here is, so we, we, we kind of get rid of the network issues completely because they are within the same campus, in fact, within, you know, within the same room sort of deal. And you're trying to figure out what needs to happen for getting the contents from a camera to the person on the other end. So you need to capture the, con the contents move from a camera, render it on the other room, and, and back and forth. So this, this would appear to be fairly simple, right? Because you, you only have, you can pair it, you practically run a cable across these two machines. And as you see from the, from the paper, turns out it's not that trivial, right? Because the cameras are, at least the commodity cameras that you buy are, are mostly tuned for recording the contents and watching them later. So you have very high latency. And we are trying to do compression on the fly, um, the compression adds enough latency that if you don't, so you, you may have to get it in an uncompressed format just because you can get it out of the, out of the camera quickly, right? And there, there are a lot of trade-offs. So if you, if you scale this to the, to the symphony they're talking about, you don't have time to compress these contents, but you don't have the bandwidth to send these contents as is. And you want a fairly good quality, at least the audio part, to, to make it sound like a symphony, right? So how do you manage those challenges was, was something that they were looking at. Um, the reason why I like this project is I, they, they're the only ones I know who are, who are going for the extremely high fidelity, you know, no compromise on quality kind of frame. The reason why they kind of stopped is there's very few people who are willing to fund this kind of research, right? So they kept going for a little bit and then um, you know, it doesn't seem like the technology, or uh, there is enough interest for 24 channel audio, right? Um, I wanted to know how it sounds, because you know, 24 channel audio sounds like, 24 channel high definition audio sounds fairly good, even, even without streaming it to another place. Um, so anyway, hopefully we'll get that video and we can look at it. So I'm, I'm gonna go through like some intro slides on the, the paper for today. And again, this is a sketch from, that they have from uh, UNC, um, swiped it from the, from the web. So essentially, what they're trying to do is, so there's not much funding because, you know, like tele-symphony across the across continent doesn't seem like that's a, that's a good application where people want to spend money and stuff. Whereas a tele-immersive conference is something that most companies would love to have, right? So the idea here is instead of having people travel back and forth and get stuck in airport, you know, sitting in Cincinnati doing nothing, right? You would like to be able to all congregate in one place, right? I mean, the, the world, so one of the discussion we were having was, the world is going towards a place where having a conference proceedings is, is, is fairly useless, right? How many of you, if I ask you, how many of you prefer conference proceedings, if you've been to a conference, in a paper copy, how many of you prefer it in a DVD uh, or CD form? How many of you would go with? Well, I, I think the paper co copy is nice when you're physically at the conference, mm -hmm. because I like being able to have the paper copy while somebody's talking and flip through it. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, not once I leave the conference, I'd rather have mm -hmm. the, the CD. Mm -hmm. It's easier to share it with people, it's smaller, mm -hmm. You know, it's easily archivable. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess personally, I, I think there is an argument for both. Mm -hmm. So I think what you need is a, like an electronic reader, electronic something to write on stuff, right? The, one of the things that I, I love is being able to annotate it, not sit in front of a, a laptop, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think the technology is there for me to make it feel like it's paper, right? For me to kind of take a notes on, on, on this thing, and mark it up or whatever on the fly, but it's not there, right? But there are a lot of reasons why most of the conferences don't want to do paper copies. If for one thing, it's expensive. For another thing, you know, it, it takes you time to print those things, so they would like to do a 
CD or DVD copy, right? But turns out, a lot of, at least for people who are in academia, that's not a good thing, right? Because if you do citations, if you do bibliographic entries, people want page numbers. And you think that that's, that's such, so like, what, 90s or 2000s, right? Um, but most of you, if you go for any kind of stuff, page numbers are more important than you realize, right? A lot of, lot of the older faculty assume that if there's not a page, page number, there is some ad hoc stuff. I mean, they, they want the page number to know that there's a proceeding, right? So they had to actually generate, for this conference, they had to generate page numbers, even though the proceedings are only on a DVD, right? So there's no page ever, right? But you still have to generate pages, right? So there, there are, there are, there are, you still have to work with these kind of uh, restrictions, right? But in, in, in terms of the office of the future, you would love to have some kind of way to collaborate in this space. So the, the focus on, on, on what, what these people are doing and sort of related to what, what Clara Nall is doing is being able to say, have this room, like, you know, the cost is not the factor, right? I don't, I don't care what you do here, put all kind of equipment, but I want to be able to collaborate with somebody in the most natural form, and, and 3D immersion is, is considered to be one such form, right? So here, if you see, it's not clear which, which one is, is real and which one is being projected, right? So hopefully th this person is sitting here for real, and these people are sitting here in a virtual space, you feel like you are there, and you, they're all working on this this model in the in the in the middle, right? And they're trying to point out, and you see these laser pointers because laser pointers are a good way for people to kind of point out stuff, right? So you want to be able to point a laser or point something here, and the other person sees it, right? So if you if this person was to use a, use one of this laser pointer and point at this stuff. On the other end, it looks like there's a pointer here, right? So that's that's the concept of the that's the model of the office of the future. So you want all the you you want the, to feel like you are right there, right? So this requires a lot of technologies that I'll I'll give a hint um, as as we move forward, right? So the, the, the one of the things is how do we do this 3D display? What kind of a way do you show 3D, right? We don't have time to go through all this stuff. Some of the things that people looked at are the head-mounted head displays. You might have seen them on, on movies and stuff. Essentially, you have a head-mounted display. You, have, you may have a camera or something in your front. So whenever you move your head, right, it, you get a different view, right? So essentially, you, your idea is if I put this display on and I can see from here the virtual 3D view, and if I move my head, right, I should see the, the contents in this virtual space, right? For a long time, that's that's how people were, you know, some of these projects were, were trying to do those because they, they give you uh, good good um, images, right? But the problem is you have eye fatigue. How many of you tried those little LCD TVs that you can hook up to your DVD player and, and watch your TV, right? They, they sell this little, I think like $800 or something. You can buy these little ones, you can, it, it's like a eyeglass kind of thing with, with like some wires going through. So you can you can hook it up to your DVD player and it's supposed to look like a HD TV which is like five or six foot out. So you can you can sit in the aircraft and you know watch a high definition TV, right? If you if you if you haven't seen those, right? So it's not very expensive, but the problem is you get eye fatigue, right? You get after, I think, an hour or something, your eyes get very tired, right? And there's some fundamental limitations because the you're simulating something, they basically project the stuff on your eye, right? I don't understand how the all the whole issues of what really happens, but essentially your eye is not actually focusing, it's not actually doing any work, right? Because the, the image is being projected on your eye or is shown so close. Right? So you, even though it looks like a good picture, your eye is not doing what it naturally does, which is kind of focus, move, and stuff, because it's actually kind of thrust into your eye kind of stuff, right? So you, you get eye fatigue, so you can't watch them for more than half an hour or one hour or something, right? But you still, you get the good, best picture, except you can't deal with that for, for too long. Back in the days, like back in 98, it used to be pretty heavy and stuff, but it, these days it's not very heavy, right? 
So one of the ways that they do that, you know, they have this display which actually looks like a, I guess I wish I had a picture of those. So if you ever fly, right, one of the sky mall things, one of the, the airline, uh, the, um, the shopping thing, they have one of those on, on the thing, right? And the other thing that they do is they have um, laser sensors and you have, you, you wire the whole room so it figures out where you're looking, right? Back in the days, they used to have all the, all the stuff in your head, so it was fairly heavy for you to move the stuff, but now you can, you can move um, efficiently. Why don't they just put, have the image not focus, so it make your eye work? I don't understand the, what's the, what's the deal with the eye, right? Okay. No, but, but essentially you're still, project, you're still projecting it, right? So, there's a difference between your eye projecting something and this being focused on the eye, apparently, because you have an illusion of distance, right? Whereas there is none, right? So there is something with the eye that, that makes it um, get fatigued, right? It, it, it's okay for a little bit, but for, for long periods of time, it doesn't work, right? But there's another, so some other things that they were, they're working on is the, this one industry which really wants 3D, uh, 3D objects to take off, 3D displays to take off, and, and that's the um, advertisement industry, right? How many of you seen Minor Minority Report movie? Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, yeah. What movie? Minority Report. Minority Report. Oh, yeah. Right? So the idea is advertisers are basically trying to get your attention somehow, right? They put the, this colorful stuff, they put all this stuff, but Imagine something which shows something in 3D here, right? It, it may be rudimentary, but imagine uh, how, how much it will capture attention, right? Minority reports show something like this, you know, the, the guy is walking, the, the displays kind of follow you, and you, sh you see all the stuff, and he does this, uh, you know, one of this, the boom and stuff, right? And I have a video to show something like that, right? But essentially, the first company which can do 3D video free form in air, right? Forget about cost, right? It's going to make it big, right? I'm saying forget about cost because surely if, if, if it's very expensive, you're not going to see McDonald's advertisements on those, right? But who cares, right? Maybe it'll show it'll start showing off BMWs or something, right? But the attention that it gets, it's so phenomenal that whoever gets there first is going to make a big deal, right? So the advertisement industry is kind of driving this in terms of display technology because they, they're, they're, they're trying to go for the cost. There's apparently another technology where you have like a curved surface, you have projection onto it, so you, when you walk across, you can actually see 3D. And right? again, again, from an advertisement perspective, imagine going in an airport where you have these long corridors with, with practically nothing or these little still, still images, right? So if you can show some level of 3D there, right? And most of the airports have these tunnels which have like lights and stuff, right? But get rid of the lights, right? Put, put, if you can show 3D of, of objects hanging, that's supposed to be like a humongous market painting up there. So they're, so these technologies would eventually move towards whatever the advertisement technology comes up with as, as a good 3D form, right? So you need a way to show these things. You need a way to capture these things, right? And next few slides, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, what, what happens, and you need a way to send these constructs from one end to the other end in a good enough fashion that you can actually interact with these things. So we are nowhere close to this, this world where they're actually interacting seamlessly, right? And, and it, as you can see in, in the, the TV work that Clara is gonna talk about, it's very rudimentary, we have ways to go, right? But it's assumed that once you build these things, it'll, it'll change everything, you know, we don't have to fly anymore, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, they had little snapshots on, on, on what they were able to achieve within the UNC lab. So, that's the conceptual view of what you want to go. Um, so, one of, the, one of the other ways you would, you know, it, it's not, it's not free-flowing, but it seems like you, you can create a notion of a wall, right? So, this is the other person on the other end, and you want it to be good, feel good enough that you can sort of hand out a paper, right? Obviously you can't transport the paper, but um, <laughs> change the metaphor in some sense to make that happen, right? 
And of course, if you can do one, how about a two, right? So you have one person here, one person here. So again, it still looks looks sort of unreal because it looks like you know there, there are two uh, projections. So this guy has the the head mounted thing which figures out where his head is. So based on where his head is, the display would would shift, right? It's it's it's, it's a normal projection like like one you have here, but when he moves his head, the display would shift to make it look like he's looking right there, right? So again, it's not going to be as good as the, the other technologies I, I, I talked about, but it's cost effective, because all you need is like one of these, these projectors, and you can have uh, these, these kind of displays. Right? So, I don't know what, what they're talking about. I guess he's saying hello kind of thing, right? So this is this is the this is ultimately where you want to go, right? So the model here is there's one person here, there's another person sitting on the other end, right? Being rendered and, and shown like they were here in 3D. So you see this dotted dotted kind of stuff and, and Clara's work also shows like something like that. So that's the best we can get in terms of showing a point point um, point using points to show a 3D objects. Right. So it essentially looks like that person is sitting here with you. If you move your head, you see the different points on, on this person's head. But what you, they're really trying to do is they're working on this 3D model. I don't know if you can see it. Right? There's, there's a 3D shape here. Right? And you have this the laser pointer showing something on the object. Right? So these two are collaborating and working on a 3D model of something using a 3D, uh, using, a, using a pointer, right? And, and different views of the same thing, you know, being able to point, being able to show what you're, what you're showing and, you know, being, seeing it on, a, on the other end, right? So for now to, to get in anywhere close to that dream, right, the, the, the all kind of issues. So the, um, the UNC, you know, they, they have a whole bunch of, they have seven cameras. So the, the paper talks about how to synchronize them and, and stuff. Essentially, you have seven cameras pointed at this person. Using the cameras, you, you, you get the 3D model, right? You get the, the, um, the depth information um, through, I don't know what, this, what, the, what they're talking about with this little circles, right? Essentially, They're so, showing you which cameras they're using for correspondence. Yeah, they're saying they're using not stereo, but something like stereo, which uses three cameras, and they're not using all of them at the same time. Okay. So when they're determining correspondence, they're using the cameras that they're showing. That's correspondence. That's why there's the five triocular views. Um, when you want to do stereo, the tricky part is determining which pixels on the one image correspond to the pixels on the other image. And saying that this pixel corresponds to this pixel is the process of correspondence. Finding all of those is an extremely challenging computer vision problem that is necessary to do stereo or most passive methods. Excellent, right? So those. Sorry, but I can, if anyone's interested in that, I can. So to, to add, add to that, right? No, I, I, think, I think that's, that's excellent. Um, intro to you know what what these people are trying to do right and, and, and the key here as far as I understand is how well you can synchron I mean how well you, can you figure out where these corresponding points are well, right and like they have that checkerboard in the back mm -hmm. well the like checkerboard is probably not used for that the checkerboard is probably used for calibrating the lenses on the cameras oh okay and you have to do color correction, all those things, right? So you have to do all the stuff, and then you, you set this stuff up, right? So in this work, it's all, you know, do you assume that it's all calibrated and set, set a certain way, right? The work we'll see on HP wants to do this on a laptop or a desktop, right? But you don't have the luxury of having these things and calibrated up front, right? So they, they, they built a kind of a rig using webcams to get the same information. Yes? And I get the five dell Plug processor servers on the right are the amount of processing power you need. Yeah, yeah. So, that's, yeah. So, to get yeah to get these things to figure out what the 3D image is, you need 
Correspondence uh, requires very, very brute computing. You need a lot of computing power to do it. Yeah, so the, the, the vision we saw, right? So the, the back end to that, you know, just for capturing this, you need this much computing power. Um, so we're talking about, you know, humongous computing power to get the whole thing going, right? Yeah, but the other thing is, I think they're doing personal comment, but I think they're doing overkill with their cameras. So I think that's part of the reason that they're having this this issue. I don't think you need anywhere near as many cameras as they're using. So, so the different groups are trying different approaches, right? So. Um, you know, like, I think the USC model would have gone for even even more cameras, right? They, they were going for 60, 24 channel audio. If I look at it in, in terms of video, you're talking, you're going for that many cameras, right? Yeah. So I don't think any, like I don't think they all agree on what is the right number of cameras you need and what's the quality. And I'm going to get get back to that later, right? So the UPen apparently you know has 15 cameras for trinocular vision, right? So that's the kind of rig that they have at, at, at the other side, right? So all this looks like, so is it, is, it, is it fair to understand that this means that if I'm looking here, you see the 3D, but you don't see my back of my head. Oh, right? yeah. You don't have any yeah. cameras, right? Yeah. So in the, in the vision of the future that they had, you, know, you, could, you could kind of look around, you don't have to be looking in one direction, right? So you, you kind of want, Many cameras throughout the room. Would that be? Well, if you want to capture everything. Yeah. Yes. But see, the other thing is they're not really, the way that they're doing their vision wouldn't accommodate that. The, what they're doing is they have what I'm going to call camera pods. They've got these three camera pod mm -hmm. setups. And each camera pod is generating 3D and they're merging them separately. But they're not really considering the data from, let's say, the purple camera pod with the data from the blue camera pod which you could totally do. The okay. other guys were kind of doing that. Okay. But if you really wanted to capture a whole room, you wouldn't just consider these guys independently. You'd have cameras all around the room, and you'd consider the guys closer to each other. Okay. Um, so, like, the systems folks will consider these to be vision group, right? Vision, you kind of do the stuff and then get the streams out, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge vision. Vision procedure. problem, right? Yeah. And, then the, and then on the other end, you have the graphics problem. Right, which is the rendering problem. Right, once you collect all this stuff, and then you collect the, the 3D views of it, um, and again, the the I'm just picking it up from the um, from the slide. Right, so essentially you, you have all these views, and then you do something. So essentially, you want to render it on the other end to this pixelated form. Right, so where, depending on where you're looking, you see a 3D view. Right. right. And that, I, my understanding is from the graphics community, right? Why don't they do a little filtering to get out all the splotches? Those aren't splotches. They're showing you the raw pixels. Oh, okay. So really what, what they're giving, what you get natively from this process is a little color value, right? Because you know the color from the, the 2D image, and then a 3D location. Yes. And so what they're showing you at the bottom is just literally the points, right? which can kind of look like surfaces if you get the points close enough together or if you play all sorts of crazy tricks, but they're not actually generating a 3D surface out of there. Mm -hmm. um, there's an entirely different area of computer vision that tries to deal with how do we take all these points and produce surfaces from them. Mm -hmm. And there are certainly algorithms that work, although nowhere near perfectly. And, and my understanding was even getting here is so computationally hard that doing the real time smoothing to make it look like a human being rather than this, you know, the bunch of points is harder, right? Well, it's actually, it, it, it's not hard from a programming standpoint. The code is actually surprisingly simple, mm -hmm. but it, it's very intensive. It requires a lot of power to do. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing uh, 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 one, more rack, one more rack of computing trying to make it look smooth, right? Mm -hmm. So depending on what group you're in, right? So if your group yeah. is, is worried about how the packets are sent, you don't really care about, I guess, to some extent, right? Well, except if you were smart, I mean, this is me as a computer vision guy looking at what they're doing. If you were smart, turning it into a surface, and then there are all sorts of great algorithms you can use to simplify the surface. Do you know this group? To compress that so much mm -hmm. that your transmission would be significantly less. 
Okay. You're, they're trading um, processing. You know, you, you can try and compress this stuff in ways that you can never see, right? I mean, it's kind of like MPEG versus. Okay. You know, if you can do that, you, th this field is wide open, right? Because like one of the one of the one of the the papers I saw for this year's multimedia system, multimedia uh, AC multimedia was. Um, they were trying to figure out, so if you imagine that these pictures have the, you know, the, the usual color, color coordinates plus the depth coordinate, right? How do you subsample the, the depth, depth field to transmit in a MPEG-like stuff, right? right? Right, I mean, the answer is you don't transmit it as a depth field, you transmit it as, as a surface. But the, the problem is the, the No, the, 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 that paper was talking about how to sub, subsample it, right? I'm not saying that's. I'm saying that's that's the best I've seen, right? At yeah. least by from the stuff. So, if well, you if you know any better way, processing power problem because the, the the processing power required to do this in real time. Mm -hmm. I I don't know what it would be, but it's it's past the five quad core processors. To okay. Give you an idea. But I'm saying like the, the, uh, like the, what we're talking here is is it's all wide open, right? So if you if you see some ways to solve that. Then, yeah. I mean, th these are happening right now. These these are supposed to be you know you know the leading edge of w what people are doing, right? Um, so the the other component that you have to worry about is how how you would interact with these things, right? So showing 3D videos is one thing, and being able to interact with them is another thing, right? So how do you show that? And and the UNC group has this notion of. Um, 3D pointers that you can use to point because now you can't actually say this, right? I need to be able to say this, right? And when I say this, and if I say this, you know, like the hair here should be black, right? It should appear just like that on your side, and you should be able to interact by saying, no, 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 not here, but here, right? They all should coordinate, right? And I'll actually show you a video to, sh to um, see what I mean. and. Some of the displays you, know, you can have these. So, so these are these are simpler, right? These are just Polaroid, and you have two projectors. One of the this is like the, the old 3D movie uh, kind of stuff, right? So that you can use to um, see these things. And yeah, you can you can have this head-mounted display trying to figure out where your location is. And there are cheaper ways and and, and more complicated ways. So the, the, the key here is the more complicated ones are quite accurate, so they can actually figure out where your head is, um, but they also tend to be heavy, right? And this massive amount of computation when you move your head, the whole world has to be recomputed and given back to you fast enough that you don't you don't get motion sickness, right? So one of the things that they said was like to walk with this. Um, I forget what's the movie, right? This one movie where um, there's a lawnmower guy. Lawnmower man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? Yeah. And he's in the funky thing that like spins around. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. And, and, and one of the one of the guys was saying like, if you don't do those, if you just so one nice thing is you're kind of like strapped to it, right? But he said if you if you have this on your head where you can't see the rest of the world, it's fully covering you, right? And then you tend to fall down, right? Because if that's your view and if it's not accurate enough, right? You get you get motion sickness, right? Um, you want these things to be, I mean, you want this to be like um, like the movie, my, Minority Report, right? If it's slow, then basically you move and your, your view hasn't caught up with you, right? So your brain thinks that you haven't moved, so you keep moving, right? So you, yeah, you eventually you fall down, right? Um, so it's good to be strapped down because then you can fall down without actually falling down. Uh, <laughs> So the latency on, on the 3D systems are, are a lot more annoying, right? Because if, if I move my head and I don't see a picture change, then my head keeps moving because it, it, it's thinking that something should be there and, and nothing changes, right? So, this is one advertisement that I just saw. I don't, know. I don't know how much of it is true, but it's supposed to be a 3D display, right? Yeah, they, there is 
touch with that. Yeah, yeah, 360 is a new volumetric display. You can say that it's a new way of seeing free-floating video. The Kioptic is built like a pyramid shape chamber, and inside you have 3D objects free-floating in the air. Yeah, like, like those, right? Yeah, this won't be good enough for uh, interacting because you can't go inside the thing to interact with it, right? You have to interact from the outside. Um, but it sounds like the Star Wars movies where they have the big planet in the middle and you know, you're pointing with something, right? How does that work? Huh? Do they explain how this works? No. I don't even know if it actually really works or if it's just a simulated video, right? Do you know if it actually works? Well, I don't know about this company, but the ones that actually work can either be that, that I know about. There's two different competing categories. There's people who literally made a 3D LCD box. Mm -hmm. So they've got LCD layers in front of each other that are see-through, and so they can light up the pixels wherever you want. The other one, which is what I think this one probably is, is they have a flat screen that spins really, really fast. And as it spins, it spins so fast that you can't actually see the screen. But as it lights up at the different rotations, it can produce an image everywhere. And yeah, this one they said there's like a like a prism, and it's something is inside the prism, right? So maybe this one works differently too. I mean, there's a lot of different whatever, ways right? Different ways but imagine that. like something like this selling uh, selling you something, right? Yeah, have you seen the ones that they shoot up like the, they shoot like compressed air, water in the air? Oh like yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that in the they had a demo there. Yeah, so like, there, there are there are things that they, 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 the one I saw was like you know there's like a mist coming down like this, and they have projection to make it look. Yeah. It's like sort of like the the Disney Disney World. They have this big water water fountain, and they make this stuff, right? Um, but they, it's not bright enough. I mean, you can't leave it in a room like this, right? So I, ultimately, you would want it. I'm I'm not sure how bright this is, right? You want it to be. It looks not like they're using standard LCD projectors. If you look around the top of their frame, you can see them every once in a while. Okay. It looks like they're using almost commodity. Whatever. Right? Yeah. yeah. So if you can make this, you know, you know, you know, not cost a billion dollars, but make it make it reasonably expensive, inexpensive, then um, that's great. What? No, I mean reasonable, right? So this is this is like some video. Uh, Be able to tilt around like that. You know? Like somebody was showing, like you know the. Right. Again, it's a long video, and you can look at the stuff. But you know, people are looking at different ways of how you'd interact. In the in the 3D world, right? Not using this stuff, but being able to. Um, um, if I was seeing this on a 3D vision, I'd probably feel seasick, right? Because he's just going all over the place, and I'll probably feel loosey. But um, it's supposed to be like the. Because I think I think the, the whatever interface we, you know it'll eventually happen has to be something like this, right? I mean, it may not be so intuitive to us, but you know, it has to feel like. Uh, Did you see the furniture from the Air article on Slash Shock the other day? Kind of yeah. It was pretty cool. They've got these camera setups. They follow light pens that can tell where it is, and people would sketch furniture. Like mm -hmm. artists would go in and sketch a piece of furniture, and then they would use rapid prototyping to make it. Oh. So it would have these weird, like swirl, swirly things, and like it was it was pretty cool. It was like a 3D sketch in the air. Do the right things. They were all done. Intuitive things. Do kind of exactly what you expect. Anyway, so. Um, so multi-touch kind of interaction research is a, is a very active field right now in HCI. Yeah, so you know the the HCI field would love to get this going in a fashion where, so the the, the point is the teleimmersive office of the future involves you know practically all aspects of computer science. Right, the, the guys who are doing the, like the, the people who wrote the paper are worried about the networking aspects of it. Right, 
So they're not really worried about the 3D aspects of it, but you have to have the HCI people, human computer interaction people, trying to figure out how the interaction should happen, how the display should be done, how the, um, you know, a whole, whole bunch of things have to come together so that you can get, and, and, the, and the nice part is they all have to happen in, in pseudo real time, right? So you would probably have a whole computer, I mean, so for this, if you were to do this in this room, right, you'll probably have computers for the rest of this building rendering something within this space, right? Uh, so the last video I have is, that's my mouse. So I was just telling, this is actually our uh, journalist here to record some of the things that we are doing. And that's Clara. From the news well. So this is the, the, the one that she'll talk about on Thursday. So that's Clara. So they were they were they were not they, so they were going for more um, modest stuff. So they're not trying to do 3D vision. So they they their metaphor is uh, dancers' wall, right? Like dancers have this mirror that they practice against, right? So they want to have sort of like the mirror on this side. So you kind of practice to a monitor, right? And and dancers are apparently used to that, right? Wait, what? Why would you use a mirror? What? Why would you use a mirror? Oh, because dancers apparently practice with the mirror. I'm not a dancer, so I don't know what they do. Like, Me neither. But you've seen in the movies, right? Like, there's a big mirror on the side, and they dance to the mirror, right? Right. So why do you because you can mirror? practice with people somewhere. Oh, no, no. So, so, oh, okay. oh, yeah. So you, you'll see the... Yeah, so they, they have, like, I think, like, um, few cameras. You can listen to this stuff, probably. Yeah, now she'll do the... One of the cool things is they'll try to touch each other, right? And that's... So when you're, when you're practicing with somebody and they're showing you to dance, right? You want to be able to touch them. And your teacher is in one location and you are in another location. Yeah, so she's... See, you see that there are two people, right? The other person is in Berkeley, right? And this is in oh. Illinois, right? And... What are they doing? You'll actually see the video. The thing Looks like they're fighting. <laughs> Moral comment. So, so one of the things that she was saying, like you, you, you can ask her, right? There, there are certain things that the dancers like, there are certain things that the computer scientists thought is not good for the dancers love, right? So again, you, you, the, the picture here is the pixelated one. You'll, you'll see the picture in a little bit. Exactly. Are they doing it that way? Because that's, they should be using... Yeah, so this is the... Yeah, they're using stereo. I'm surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it looked like they were fighting. Yeah, it's supposed to be like, you know, she's supposed to see where the other person is and then go with the stuff, right? Yeah, and they have, I don't know how many cameras. Uh, hang on. Wow, it's not keeping up very well. Yeah, the other person is in Berkeley, so. Which, which there's one scene where they try to all like uh, touch each other, and it's it's so hard because you need to get the synchronization right where you know where you so you gotta look at this picture to see that you're touching. Other person has to touch, and eventually they'll kind of like overshoot and and which video it was.
they, they may get the video down right. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so this is essentially the other person dropped out, so. I'm surprised that they're doing it this way. There's, there's a better way to do it. Yeah, so in the... And you'll see like some of them are not dancers, so they'll be like walking back and forth. <laughs> just because it's just... Yeah, so the three people are supposed to... Yeah, three different... Yeah, they, they kind of... So if you move away from the thing, you don't see them, right? Uh, so, and she said that they, they didn't mind that. That, so it's, they, they have to dance within this little location. So if you move, move away, you vanish. But they, that didn't bother them as much. But they wanted, even if it goes away, they still know that they are still dancing. Um, these, are, these are real dancers, so they don't know much about the, the, the computing aspects of it. Yeah, I think at, 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 at some point, I think this is the video where they tried to... Uh, yeah, I think, I think this person in the back doesn't really know dancing because she's like randomly going back and forth, whereas the front, two in the front is trying to coordinate, right? But whatever, right? So this is this is the the stuff that she's she's talking about. Again, you make compromises on what you want to do, right? So the 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 UNC model we saw was wants to go, you know, to a yeah. So the the third person now decides would decide to. Um, she'll go right through their hands, right, and. Yeah, so this is the, the you're, you're trying to hug. Anyway, so. Um, I was gonna say, this isn't actually 3D, but have you seen the latest Cisco teleconferencing? Uh, yeah, it's already. They just launched a couple weeks ago? I yep, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, yeah. I, I saw about it. Yeah. Do you know anything more about it then? Well, I just I just read an article and apparently they have like the 60 inch high definition plasma screens that mm -hmm. kind of feels like you're sitting in the same room as the other person and did this concert in I think it was uh, San Francisco and New York City. So the the, the it was really it was saying, the people who were there it was like they never seen something like that before like especially when when they're trying to cut down on traveling costs these days because apparently everybody's not cheap. So the the, the 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 paper we'll see on 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 Thursday goes in the same market, right? Like HP is trying to get into the same market as Cisco and all those things, right? So they're not trying to push technology beyond where it has to go, right? So they're, they're worried about sort of like the access grid, the one uh, I said in the OIT building, right? Have lots of high quality cameras, have lots of high quality videos that it, they don't pretend to make it look like you are there. It's not really immersive in any sense. They, they want it to look like, they, they'll be happy to have just a TV monitor which shows me in 2D, right? Because they're, they're trying to make money, not not push push envelope, right? So they're not trying to see if you can share. Yeah, that, that's not their, their goal, right? Well, the idea is just to make a meeting feel like the person is there. Yeah, for, for, for a lot of lot of meetings, that, that's okay, right? So if, you, if all you want is to, so for the conference style, right? So if, if you're going to a conference right now, right? there's hardly any interaction between the presenter and the rest of the audience, right? So you'll just be as happy if you had a camera and you brought the video here and showed it here, right? Because at most conferences, you rarely hug each other or dance with each other, right? <laughs> um, and, and that's what they're trying to get. I mean, that, that's a big market, right? Like the access to it is, is part of the stuff. And it's, and it's not cheap at all. Like just the hardware, well, well Cisco was selling the whole package for $750,000. Which is not much when you consider the travel cost, right? Well, somewhere over fifty thousand dollars, because you need two of them, right? Well, actually, no, it's the whole package. You get the two sites, oh, okay. the two like the six plus one sixteen screen. Okay, two hundred fifty thousand dollars is a lot, lot of money to send. 
peons like us, right? Yeah. But um, the CEO, if he if he can avoid going for one day, yeah. they probably make you know enough money to yeah. pay off for one or two trips, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I can see this especially like between like corporations like I don't know Chrysler and and, and Daimler and uh, um, Mercedes, mm -hmm. Mercedes or whatever in Germany. Like they have mm -hmm. a plane flying back and forth like every other day. You can save money mm -hmm. by just using these kind of conference systems, and I can see them buying things like this. I can yeah, see people, regular people. Buying so money. there's actually a conference room right in this building, right? I don't know how many of you used it, right? You you probably seen it, right, William? Yeah. The, the one downstairs, right? I, I forget what the room is. Uh, when you, as you walk in, right, from that, from Fitzpatrick, if you take a left, I think the first room, right? This one, which sort of gives you that, that feel, right? Um, and I don't think, I don't, so the reason why you go to conferences is you, you know, who cares about the, the presentations and stuff, right? Because you, you read the paper, you know what, what's, what's going on. So, very few people actually go to the to the meeting and stay at the thing, right? Where you very goes for the the social aspects of meeting other other people, right? If you haven't gone to a conference, if you haven't like traveled a lot, right? That, that's the reason why you take the effort to go there, right? So I think all the the the, the video chatting and everything is good enough for for casual chat, but if you want to roll up your sleeve and work on some project, they're not good enough, right? That that's my view. view. Like if you, if you if you have these two two teams, one in uh, you know within Dharma Chrysler, one in like you know Europe, and one in here, and they're working on some documents where they can send a PowerPoint to each other and they look at the presentations that they could do right now. But they're, if they're working on a car and you you bring a car and you say this is the one I design. I, I don't know how they design cars, right? But you know if they have a car, right? This this a this a there's a thing about the being tactile, being able to interact in, in some sense, right? And that's what these kids are trying to achieve, right? Uh, in, in terms of the research stuff, you know, you know, the, the TIF system is a lot simpler because they, they make some, some assumptions, right? They, they don't try to do 3D displays at all. I mean, the 3D display is on a flat panel monitor, and they'll be happy to have one or two monitors, and they, they don't have good cameras. So what is, the, what is the concern about their work? You mean the work we just saw? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there, there, there's just other computer vision methods that I think would give them what they actually want. Um, that's so less computationally intensive and would look a lot better and would easily allow you to capture all sides. The other person, the Rukshana Bakshi, I think, the one in Berkeley, mm -hmm. I, I thought was a vision person. I don't know. I mean, there's plenty of people that would tell you you should do it that way, but there's a, there's a concept called the visual hall. Okay. So what you kind of do is you don't need nearly as many cameras, unless if you want to capture all around, you need cameras on all sides. But what it kind of does is just get your outline, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of flat parts on the image, mm -hmm. but you can texture it with the image that you have. Okay. And when you look at it, it looks almost as good. It's pretty hard to tell the difference if you have, it just depends how many cameras you have, just like this. So, um, yeah. but, so I'm just saying there's a lot of other vision methods that... You should definitely bring it up, right? Because, you know... Um, Right. So yeah, I mean, I should talk to her about it. I mean, maybe there's a reason, but I. Yeah. So I so, do you recognize the other person? Uh, the name. What was the name of the other person? Rukshana, I think Bakshi, I think. No. But I mean, there's a lot of vision people. I don't know whether it's he or she, but that person is at Berkeley, and that's the other end of the of this group, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't recognize it, but you know, this isn't my exact area of yeah. research either. So. so, no, so Clara's research is, is not on the 3D um, aspects of it either, unless it, it solves some systems kind of problems, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, she'd be interested in hearing other, other views on this stuff, right? But people who want to really capture a room, like when you were talking about capturing all sides, mm -hmm. they, they tend to use visual holes more. It okay. means less cameras, it's less computationally intensive. It doesn't give you as exact 3D, but if you're what you're looking for is a visualization, not a measurement. Okay. Which tends which to me is what they're doing. Um, it's I, I think it's a better way to go. Okay. 
but th th yeah, th these are like the sort of like the forefront of the the, the whole uh, the research that, that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of, and the the difference is in terms of what kind of hardware that they want, right? So the, the one in HP we'll see in, on Thursday, they they built a like a rig around you, right? So it, it's supposed to be hooked up to your monitor. You have this rig around you with cameras on on it, right? And, and the cameras are webcams, right? So that is designed for enterprise um, video conferencing from the desk for normal human beings, right? Not the, the Cisco 150,000 kind of stuff, but more of $100, $200 camera. So rather than having one single camera, you have this rig, and you're still get, supposed to get enough 3D to have a video, video conference, right? So the, 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 every, every group is trying to figure out what the price point is. You know, do you go all the way out to say, give me the best money you can buy and, and where I want to be? to uh, where you want to be, whatever you can, you know, like a webcam kind of stuff. And so in, in that sense, the Cisco systems are, you know, not, you know, they're, they're not trying to attack the same problem, right? But not that this, so I, I think the, the one, so one of the thing you mentioned was $750,000 for the equipment, right? You also have to figure out a room for it, right? A room which is not just any old room, you have to, have, you know, you need a fairly big room, soundproofed, and all those things, right? So those things add cost too, right? And really, you'll, you'll wire the room for that yes. purpose only. Like, it yes. will be a room just for teleconferencing with whatever other place. How many of you have seen the, the OIT room? You guys should. What? Yeah, over, over there, yeah. by the library. Yeah, yeah, they just have, like, huge screens. Yeah. And, like, huge setup of screens. Yeah. You should because it's 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 a fairly short walk, right? Um, is, it, is it like open to anybody or is it? No, it's all glass, so you can actually see inside. Oh, you mean there's a bunch of machines in there too, right? Oh, that's the real machines. That's I think that's the OIT machines. Yeah. But the room next to it, I think it'll say access grid on the front. Oh. You see a lot of projectors in the on the back, and it's right next to that room. If you if you go in from the side of the building. Right, I think that's the first room. The second room is the one which has all these monitors to make it look like some mission critical stuff is going on. I, I don't know what people are doing with all. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right? They have like monitors going like like this through the wall, and there's no human being watching all this stuff. So it seemed like, you know, my impression was is just to show off that there's like a lot of important things happening in the background, but. Um, when you don't have anybody actually monitoring all the stuff, who cares whether you have, you know, 40 monitors. And so when things go bad, you know, they have 40 monitors they can look at. With 40 people? Just one person. No. Yeah, so if you're going to have one person walk, watching 40 monitors, that's the same as switching through 40 screens with one monitor, right? I, I, don't, I don't see why some human being has to kind of like be looking at this. But anyway, so I digress, right? But next to that is the, is the access grid room, right? Access grids are not cheap. I, I've heard cost up to like $5 million for, the, you know, for those kind of rooms, right? So you also have to worry about the network cost, right? So you can't just send through your normal uh, internet, inter internet to or, or something, right? So to, again, to summarize, you know, sort of the challenges, you know, there, there, are, there are a whole bunch of different challenges, and the USC paper talks about one little problem, which is, you know, how do you get the contents off these cameras with, with low enough latency that you get uh, good interactivity, right? The UNC paper talks about how do you mix all this stuff and set it on the wire, right? So you know, if you have five cameras and you're trying to get all these contents and you're sending it through a single pipe, how do you make them congestion control? How do you make them adapt to the network in one go rather than treating them differently, right? These are not independent things. They are part of one, one stream. So how do you kind of bundle them up and send it off is the focus of the, the UNC paper, right? It goes more to the networking aspects of how do you send packets, you know, whether it's TCP independent and all those things. But essentially the problem they're trying to solve is how do you mix all this information into one flow, right? And in the, in, the, in the real case where they're talking about where they, it's room size with lots of inf inputs and stuff, it becomes a lot more trickier, right? So essentially you want to have a sense of when you move from frame one to frame two, you want all the information from this room to be sent all at once 
before you go on to the next frame, right? So if you look at it from a single picture frame, you want all the frames from all the cameras, all the audio, all the whatever you can think of to be sent at once and then, and then the next step of the whole thing forward. If you don't have enough network bandwidth, you want them to be managed together, right? Where, so that you get good feedback on the other end, right? So that's so in, in, their, their particular stuff is push everything to the to the application, so the application knows which one to which one to get, you know, which information to get rid of, so you still get a good feel on the other end, right? So that that's one and. As you can imagine, like you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, these are these are small components, right? So, in the grand scheme of things, we have to figure out what kind of what, how do you capture these videos, right? And, and that affects all what you're trying to do. You may want to have a lot of high definition cameras, but as you saw from the USC work, you have to figure out how to get that much bandwidth from the camera out to the PC, and then you have to figure out how to bundle all, the, all of them up and send to the other side, like what you, what you saw from the UNC side, right? So something has got to give. So you may decide not to send high, def, high definition camera, but maybe webcam level, but you know, keep them more consistent, right? And that, that's sort of what the HP people are looking at. Then you have to worry about what kind of you know, display technology you are looking at. Um, the, my understanding was that sort of the, the way that Clara's work was, was going about, it's a lot more computer intensive than sending the streams you know, to a 3D display, right? Because you're, you're rendering it on either the client side or the server side. And talking to some of these folks, you know, it, it, depends, it, it, it really depends on where the advertising market is going because you know they feel that advertising market will solve this problem because there's a lot of money to it and they'll just piggyback off of it right so depending on what the technology is you figure out where these where these things go um, and in terms of the other issues like how do you interact with this world how do you how do you feel you know how, how, how would these things happen and what kind of network you would have um, this this Arnold Schwarzenegger movie from a while back on uh, Mars, you know, he goes to Mars and... General Rico? Yeah. Uh, any of you seen those mo that movie? And when he comes in, the whole wall is like a display, right? Um, he'll come in, he'll, yeah. it'll, it'll look like a room, and then he'll change the channel, and then the whole wall will change into a TV, and one wall will change into a, like a lake kind of thing. Um, in Fahrenheit 451, they had the same thing. There was a TV room parlor and okay. all the houses and three or four walls would all be TV screens. Okay. Things would talk directly to you very similar to what they had in my minority report. Okay. And that was written in the long term. Yeah, okay. So there the are different paradigms. Like in, in that case, they're not trying to be really smart. I mean, all, all it, you see is like a, it looked like a water, I mean, like a like lake or something, right? It's not showing anything other than that. But in that context, this is perfectly acceptable, right? You know, you go into a room and suddenly the wall changes into whatever you want it to look like, right? That was, you know, giving a good enough feel, right? Um, but but for, for the, the ultimate goal is eventually to reach a point where you can interact with, with, uh, with your friends and everything so you don't have to travel, right? Um, and the good thing is it, it's, it, nobody believes that it's going to happen anytime soon. So if you starting a career, that's a good way to go. You probably have enough stuff for, for, for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, have enough to do so we will have class on Thursday and before we, we go see her. Yeah, vision is such a, there's so many different ways to achieve similar results and I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a very interesting researcher in the game. Yeah, if, if you can kind of m go through two different fields, there's like so much potential for papers, it's yeah. not even funny, 